Welcome to the How to Pay Less Tax webinar. I'm Sean Bryant with ATBS, and I would like to thank you for joining us today. Before we get started, I want you to know that you can type in a question to the box on the right of your screen at any time. We will answer all of these questions at the end of the webinar. Also, this webinar is being recorded. If you need to jump off or lose your connection, you can go to atbsshow.com or teamrunsmart.com to watch the webinar again. There will be a few poll questions during the webinar, so please participate in those, and they will appear on your screen throughout the webinar. Now, I would like to introduce you to our presenter today. His name is Todd Amon. He is the president and CEO of ATBS. Thank you so much, Todd, for being here today, and I'll let you take it from here. Great. Thanks, Sean. I appreciate the introduction, and good afternoon, everybody. It's uh, great to be with you and talking about a super exciting topic, taxes, which I'm sure all of you uh, can't wait to hear more about. I'd like to start off by talking about just a couple of uh, my favorite quotes growing up. One was, on a long enough timeline, the survival rate for everybody is zero. And the other one is, if you live in America and make money, you will pay taxes. And to go back to a couple of things my dad taught me early on in life, and that is uh, that there are two certainties in life, and they are death and taxes. And as he taught me those things, he said, you know, if you're smart when you grow up, you'll get involved in something that will always be around and is kind of a recession-proof business. And so uh, death and taxes kind of caught my eye, and I didn't really want to be a mortician. That didn't sound like that much fun. So I picked the more glamorous of the two jobs and decided to go into the tax business. So here we are um, to talk about taxes, and uh, hopefully really our goal today is to give you some information and help you understand more about your uh, taxes. I've always found that you get the best tax return done when you know what questions to ask. A lot of people don't even have an idea where to start. And tax prepare, preparation firms, you know, can't really read your mind or, or know what goes on with you unless you tell them. So our goal is to kind of educate you and get you thinking about some things that might help you uh, be a better tax, pay, tax uh, payer and help your tax preparer do a better job for you. So to start off with, I want to just tell you a little bit about ATBS for those of you that don't know about us. Uh, we've been in the uh, business of doing taxes and business management for owner operators for 17 years. We started in 1998. We've served over 100,000 clients during that time. Every year we do about 15,000 tax returns. And um, I kind of give you those big numbers to help you understand that we do this on a broad scale. So we see everything under the sun. We do a lot of research and uh, we have the largest tax preparation department for independent contractors in the U.S. So we see a lot of things yet, kind of what you see on this slide on point three. Um, you know, we really want to treat our customers as individuals, even though we do thousands of returns. Every customer is important to us. In fact, our motto here at ATBS is that we change lives one driver at a time. So um, it's really important, even though we know all the laws and all the regulations and, you know, spend our life researching them, we want to treat you as an individual client. So um, I want to talk for just a minute about Team Run Smart, who we're doing this webinar in conjunction with. It's a uh, website and social media platform sponsored by Freightliner, really to educate owner operators and help them to be better business people. That's why it's called Team Run Smart. And uh, we partner with them and provide a lot of content to their social media platform. So you can go there and you can learn a lot of information. The community has about 25,000 members in it, and there's a lot of good blogging and newsletters and just uh, content information. It's built around four pillars, and those pillars are uh, your truck, your fuel, your business, and your health. So there's discussions every day around those things to help you do better in each of those areas. Uh, there's uh, a really neat program when you get involved and join Team Run Smart. There's a mileage reward program for participation. So if you read newsletters or you you know post information in blogs and those kinds of things, you get miles for doing that. And as you accumulate miles, there's a reward program, and you can get some pretty neat gifts from Freightliner and Team Run Smart around that. Uh, Freightliner also sponsors a group of pros, what they call the Team Run Smart Pros. And what's cool about those pros is they're living the life every day. They're driving trucks. They um, are independent contractors, and so they discuss the things they experience. There's a guy on there named Henry Albert who consistently gets over 10 miles per gallon in his truck, and he talks about how he does that, so there's a lot of good conversation around that. Uh, there's another driver that drives a natural gas truck, so he talks about the 
you know, pitfalls and opportunities around operating a natural gas truck. There's a lot of information around health in there and how to be a healthy driver on the road and those kinds of things. So uh, just as part of this, I urge you to join Team Run Smart. It's a great place to get information for you as an owner operator and as a trucker to do, uh, do great things in your business. So with that, you know, let's get on and talk about the topic at hand today, um, which is taxes. And, you know, really the goal is you work really hard to make every dollar that you make as an owner operator. And if you're like me, you hate to give any more of that away than you have to. And uh, especially you don't want to give money away to the IRS. And so our goal is to help educate you and help you understand what you pay in taxes and why you pay in taxes and help you to figure out how to pay the least amount that uh, you have to pay. Um, with that, I know Sean mentioned we're going to do a couple poll questions. And so we were going to uh, ask you a, a quick poll question here and uh, we'll put it up on the screen and if you can just if you don't mind answering the question uh, we'll give you the answers after we get the questions asked it won't take more than 30 seconds or so so the first question as you can read is uh, have you filed your 2014 taxes yet or not And the results are really not surprising because uh, it's pretty early still. We're in mid-February. About 10% of those listening have filed their taxes and about 90% have not. So uh, hopefully for those of you 90% that have not, we'll give you some good information. And those 10%, if you have and you missed something, hey, we can always go back and uh, hope you return and file it again. Um, so with that, we'll move into kind of the agenda and what we're going to talk about today. And uh, we're going to start off with understanding your tax liability. Uh, it's really incredible to me just in the last 17 years and kind of in the history of the tax code in the United States how complicated things have gotten. So we're going to just talk about various types of taxes and what you pay and why you pay them and how you pay them. Uh, we're going to talk about misunderstood deductions. There's a lot out there. You know, there's plenty of uh, truck stop CPAs that are out there giving bad tax advice. I'm giving good tax advice. I've even heard folks on satellite radio and I've read information and periodicals about, you know, good tax advice and bad tax advice. We're going to just talk about some of those. We're going to talk about must-have tax credits, and that's a really important piece. Uh, tax credits are more important than anything. Uh, as we talk about deductions, if you take a $100 deduction in an expense on your taxes, that's going to save you 20 to $25 in taxes. But if you get a $100 credit and you owe $100 in taxes, that's going to save you a dollar for dollar. So credits are, are really important. We're going to talk about those. We're going to talk about successful bookkeeping strategies. Uh, paying the lowest amount of taxes isn't just filling out the form right and having things right. It's really about being organized and uh, making sure you've got everything together so that you can do a good tax return. Uh, we'll talk about some successful tax strategies and how you can save some money on taxes. Uh, we're going to get into the Affordable Care Act. That's become a significant piece of filing a tax return these days. So we're going to talk about some of the areas around uh, Obamacare, the Affordable Care Act, and then uh, we'll have some time at the end. I'm going to be joined by Mike Callahan, who's our head of our tax department here at ATBS and is a CPA, and he'll answer any questions that you've got. So kind of moving into the nuts and bolts and talking about uh, what are taxes, you know, what are the specific taxes that you pay, how are they reported, and how do you pay them? You know, I'll start off, I, I, I do webinars like this often, and I'm on radio shows once in a while talking about taxes, and I always get the person that comes on that says, you know, as an American, it's our right. Uh, it's not in the Constitution anywhere that we have to pay taxes. And so, you know, I haven't filed a tax return in 10 years. And, you know, whether whether it's right or wrong, the one thing I will say is our country was, um, we, we fought a revolutionary war about 240 years ago over taxes when we were unfairly taxed by the British. And we decided uh, we don't want taxation without representation. We want to vote for the people that are deciding what our taxes are going to be. So, Again, whether you like taxes or not, living in America, you have the privilege of paying taxes, and that's how we get a lot of the things that we have from our roads to our schools to our military that defends us. And I never want anybody to pay more taxes than they should, uh, you know, for myself to all of my clients. Um, but at the same time, it's our obligation as American to pay the taxes that are due. So um, we'll talk a little bit about that. Income taxes are probably the largest tax that you will pay, and there's really two ways that income taxes come about. Uh, and it really depends if you're an employee or if you are self-employed or an independent contractor. If you're an employee, it's a pretty simple process. When you go to work for a company, uh, you fill out some forms, and from there on, the company takes care of it for you. They deduct out of your paycheck every week. 
the amount of taxes that you owe, your employment taxes and your income taxes, and they remit them to the government. And at the end of the year, you file a pretty simple tax return. You get a, what's called a W-2 from your company, which tells you how much you were paid and how much was deducted, and that's how you do a tax return. If you are a self-employed person or an independent contractor, like probably most of the folks on the phone listening to this and most of our clients here at ATBS, things get quite a bit more complicated. Um, when you either drive for yourself and you're running your own loads and collecting your own revenue, or if you're leased to a motor carrier, um, you'll get something called a 1099 from the motor carrier you're leased to or a lot of times for those companies that you haul for if you're hauling for the shipper direct. And so that 1099 is really just a simple form that is submitted to you and to the IRS that says exactly what revenue was paid to you. So nothing to do with expenses or withholdings or anything else. So the whole withholding of tax process stops when you're self-employed. So it gets a bit more complicated. Um, and we'll get into that in a little bit. So as far as income tax rates and understanding how much you have to pay, uh, it's really, really complicated. I've I heard one time that the IRS code has more pages in it than the King James Bible, which is really pretty incredible, but uh, difficult to understand. So tax rates depend on your income level and a lot of different things. Uh, they range anywhere from zero to 39.6% for the federal income tax, depending on how much money you make. State income tax varies, again, by state, and it can be zero if you're lucky enough to live in a state like Florida or Texas or Nevada. Uh, it can be as high as 12.3% if you live in California and you're, you're a high wage earner. So if you just think about the things I, I just said, if I lived in California and I make a lot of money, uh, my tax rate on my income can be over 51% just for income taxes alone. Uh, number two, I'm going to talk about you know, employment taxes a little bit. And so these are things that relate to Social Security, Medicare, and federal unemployment tax and state unemployment tax. And in simple terms, the Social Security rate is 15.3%. So if I am an employee working at a company and I'm going to get a W-2, again, that's all taken care of for me. And essentially what happens is the company is required to contribute half of that 15.3%. So the company pays 7.6% and you as an employee are deducted 7.6%, and that's remitted to the government, and that covers your Social Security payment. When I'm an independent contractor, that changes completely. Again, there's no more withholdings um, in the 1099, and so you become responsible for that payment yourself. And we're going to talk, again, about how that happens to a quarterly estimated tax system in a little bit. Um, but that's a little bit of you know, how the process works between your income and your employment taxes. Medicare is 1.45% of your tax. Again, employee, it's withheld as an independent contractor. You've got to pay that in quarterly estimated taxes. Sales and excise taxes, uh, I think everybody understands relatively easily. If I go to the mall and, you know, buy something at the shopping mall, there's going to be a sales tax on it. Uh, if I go and buy a truck in a lot of states, there's going to be a sales tax on that truck. Some uh, states exempt sales tax on interstate vehicles, so I don't have to pay a sales tax on that truck. Um, an excise tax, one of the easiest examples to understand is a federal highway use tax. Any owner operator that owns their own truck and it's titled in their name will pay $550 every July, and it's filed on a Form 2290. Um, so that's an example of, a, of an excise tax. Property taxes are things that you pay for owning something every year, so you can think of those in terms of like your home and your car. Um, if you own a home, you get a property tax bill every year. And, you know, things like property taxes go to support your local schools and your local fire department and police and those kinds of things. A lot of these other taxes go to supporting, you know, Social Security, retirement, Medicare, uh, covers your medical expenses when you're retired, those kinds of things. Income taxes and fuel taxes, uh, predominantly, a lot of the goal of those is to help build roads and those kinds of things. So. Um, last thing on this list is fuel taxes. The federal fuel tax for diesel fuel is 24.3%. The state fuel taxes range anywhere from 10 cents to 50 cents if you live up in the Northeast. And um, it used to be that all those fuel taxes went into the uh, Federal Highway Trust Fund to help build bro roads and bridges and all those kinds of things. And unfortunately, our government uh, found the kitty large and started stealing money out of those fuel tax funds to use them for other things, which is why some of our roads are in disrepair and those kinds of things. So again, I'm not here to make a political conversation about whether taxes are right or not. I just want to help you understand uh, how you're taxed and, and what the taxes are and in theory what they go for. So um, 
you know, now that I have really confused you with a lot of taxes and how you pay them and why you pay them and what they are, I want to try and simplify things. And so, you know, what I want to say is owner operators, it gets really difficult when you start talking about quarterly estimated taxes and how much I should pay and those kinds of things. A simple, you know, thing to keep in the back of your mind is in the end, you should probably set aside about 25 to 28% of your check you get every week, your net check that you get every week to pay taxes. If you do that, you should have enough money and you won't find yourself in a negative situation when tax time comes. That should cover your self-employment and your federal and your state income tax. And so with that, let me talk a little bit more about the quarterly estimated tax system and help you understand exactly what that means. Um, quarterly estimated taxes are really the process as, as I've talked about, if you're an employee and you work for a company, um, that company does all that stuff for you. They deduct everything uh, out of your paycheck and send it to the government so you don't ever have to worry about it. And the government's happy because they're getting their money on a weekly basis. When you go self-employed, um, none of that is done. And so what the government says is we want your money at least quarterly because all these employees are paying it on a weekly basis. We want your money at least quarterly. I guess they don't trust you to keep it yourself and make sure you pay it at the end of the year. So they want you to pay it at least quarterly. The quarterly um, estimated tax due dates are January 15th of every year, April 15th, June 15th, and September 15th. So those are the dates that the IRS wants you to file and pay your estimated quarterly taxes. There's two ways you can do estimated quarterly taxes and not get yourself in trouble or get penalties from the IRS. Uh, the first one is what's called the safe harbor method. And the safe harbor method is really simple and it's what most accountants use and CPAs when they do uh, tax estimates for their clients for the coming years. And all it really says is I take what I paid last year and I divide it by four and I pay it in the coming year, each of those quarters that I, that I said, January, April, June, and September. And so an example of that is if I owed $4,000 in taxes in 2014, then 2015, I should pay $1,000 each one of those quarters and we'll call it all good. And I won't have any penalties for underpaying my estimated taxes. We actually at ATBS prefer the method number two, which is your actual income method. And the good news for us is we do the financial statements for our customers every month. And what that means is we understand their exact cash flow. And so the reason that I like the actual income method better is because we're matching kind of your tax payments with your cash flow. So as an example, right now we're in the first quarter and freight's a little slow typically, and it has been January and February. So you don't make as much money as you do maybe in May and June. And so when we do estimated taxes based on actual income, you know, for your April 15th estimated tax payment, we probably would say something lower. We might say you should pay three or $400 because you probably earned a little bit less money and you probably don't have enough money to pay $1,000 in taxes. And then as freight picks up and you do better in the second quarter and you're making more money, we might say you should pay, as an example, $2,500 or $2,700 in the second quarter when you've, when you've made money. So you can do it both ways and you can be good with the IRS. I just think it's important that you try and match your tax payments with your income. Um, otherwise you can get behind or you can also overpay the IRS. Another thing that you need to think about if you're in the business of being an owner operator and you might have a second truck or you might have someone driving with you and team or those kinds of things, uh, the IRS and states are really cracking down on kind of this independent contractor versus employee question. And so traditionally in the past, we find a lot of drivers that will uh, pay somebody driving a second truck for them or someone that's driving their truck. Uh, they'll just pay them as an independent contractor, a simple 1099. And um, in, in theory, you know, that can work. But the problem is we've seen a lot of audits lately. And we saw one not too long ago in the state of Texas where the state of Texas went in and audited a guy and said, hey, you've got this guy driving a second truck, but you're telling him what to do every day. You're telling him where to go. Um, you know, you're making him fuel where you want him to fuel and, and you're really treating him like an employee. And so we're going to make you responsible for all that guy's social security, Medicare and income tax that, that he hasn't paid. And they gave the guy a big tax bill. So I guess really what I'm saying is I caution you, if you have somebody working for you, that you make sure you uh, classify them the right way, whether they're an employee or truly an independent contractor. So, you know, I've talked about it quite a bit, but I just think it's really important because we see a lot of our clients get behind and not making their quarterly estimated tax payments. And when it gets down to it and comes, you know, April, time to pay taxes and they haven't made any estimated tax payments, if they owe four or five or $6,000, they don't have that money. And then all of a sudden they're in trouble with penalties and interest to the IRS and those kinds of things. So it's just really good to get in the habit of paying those estimated 
tax payments. Um, you can actually go to, there's a link on this uh, slide that you're looking at, and you can go to atbsshow.com uh, forward slash 2015 tax calendar, and it'll give you all the dates that I just outlined for your quarterly estimated tax payments to, um, and all the other, the federal highway use tax, and when corporate taxes are done, S-corps, and all those kinds of things. Kind of a tax calendar to keep you online to make sure you're doing everything the right way. I want to move next to talk a little bit about um, common tax deductions and uh, you know what you can write off as an owner operator and you know most people out there that become owner operators know a lot of these things and uh, so it's simple stuff like truck lease or if I actually own my truck then uh, the depreciation and the interest I pay to the bank that loaned me the money on the truck uh, things like my operating expenses my fuel my maintenance the insurance costs that I have to pay. Um, the easiest way to think about it is any expense that I incur in the normal course of my business is deductible. And again, there's a link at the bottom of here that uh, I urge you to go to. There's an actual sheet that you can download that has probably 100 deductions on it. And, you know, there's a lot of things on there that folks don't think about. There's things like, you know, if you're buying an atlas or a map or a GPS uh, for your truck and to route yourself, you can deduct that. Things like bedding sheets for your bunk. Uh, if you buy an electric blanket because it's cold this time of year or a vacuum for your truck, you know, drug tests that you've got to get done annually to make sure you qualify for your CDL, things like your satellite radio, you can listen to the truck channel on there, you listen to the weather to see how the weather's going to be across the country, things like that are deductible. So, you know, again, go to the link at the bottom of this page and you can download um, some tax deductible items on there that you might not be thinking about. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about, as I kind of mentioned in the beginning, some maybe commonly misunderstood or uh, tax deductions that are debated by some folks. And the first one I'm going to start off with is is a controversial, for sure a legitimate deduction, but a controversial deduction, the home office. And um, I want to say, to begin with, the home office is a great deduction, and it's a true, legitimate, good deduction in the IRS's eyes. The hard part is it's a challenging deduction for truck drivers simply because the IRS applies a couple of tests to the home office rule. And one of the most important tests that they apply is uh, they say if you have a home office, it's got to be the principal place of business, where you do business. If you think about that from a truck driver's perspective, they spend all of their time doing their job in their truck. So how can their home office be their principal place of business? Another test that the IRS applies is you must have exclusive use of that room in your home for it to be a home office deduction. So you can't set a desk, you know, in a bedroom where there's bunk beds and uh, Wii video games and those kinds of things and call that your home office. It has to be a room exclusively dedicated. And so I say all those things, number one, because I do believe it's a legitimate deduction and it works for some people, but it's an, also an IRS red flag. So you hear a lot of people that want to take a home office deduction. And at the end of the day, it might be a four or $500 deduction when you go through all the calculations and everything. So it might save you $100 in taxes, but if it winds up getting you audited and it's not a valid deduction in the IRS's eyes, then it's not worth it. So, you know, all that said, another thing to think about is if you are an independent that's running under your own authority or, you know, if you have a spouse or someone else who does a lot of work for you at home, they're helping you to find loads, they're helping you to bill and collect and keep track of things and you use a spot in your home, by all means, set up a spot that you can call a home office deduction and take that deduction because it can be a good deduction. Uh, the second thing I'm going to talk about is personal vehicle miles, and this kind of ties into number three, the out-of-route miles, but let me start with personal vehicle miles. Uh, every mile that you use your personal vehicle, your pickup truck or your car or whatever it is for your business is deductible. So if you, when you're home, you know, on a weekend and you need to go to uh, the auto parts store to get some supplies for your truck or you need to go to the bank to you know do some banking stuff or you need to go to the post office to mail some receipts to ATBS to put in your profit and loss statement all the mileage associated with doing that you can deduct at 57 and a half cents per mile the key is you need to document that and so it's just keep a you know notepad in your in your car and say you know I drove 25 miles to do this errand on this day uh, related to my business and at the end of the year you can tell us how many miles you drove and it can add up to be a pretty significant amount so a uh, really a good deduction that a lot of people don't take the time to to go through the effort to fill out the details but it can be a good tax deduction for you um, so number three out of route miles uh, I would maybe call this one of the most understood misunderstood deductions out there and I hear it miss uh, discussed on the radio all the time and 
I hear a lot of drivers talking about it. And so, you know, I understand what they're talking about and I understand their frustration. So let me kind of walk you through an example. Um, a little over a year ago, I went on a ride with a driver because I hadn't been on the road in a while, and I just kind of wanted to be back in a truck and see what the road was like these days. And we went from Denver to Dallas. And when we got the load, it was routed, and we were supposed to go through um, kind of some the shortest distance, of course. Trucks are routed on the shortest truck legal highway. Uh, that's how things are typically get paid by shippers. And so it was telling us it was going to be about 800 miles from Denver to Dallas. And it routed us through some kind of two-lane you know, through southeast Colorado um, kind of roads. Uh, unfortunately, it had snowed the night before, like it uh, did a couple of days ago here in Denver, and we had about a foot of snow on the ground, so the highways weren't in great shape. And so the driver, thankfully, decided to take the safest route he could, and we took I-70 out and through Kansas and then went south on I-35 and got to Dallas. Um, so the end of the story is, we actually drove about 900 miles, even though the load only paid 800 miles because they were routed to go the shortest route. So the frustration and what I hear from a lot of drivers is that 100 miles that I didn't get paid for should be deductible. And so what I hear a lot of people say is they go to number two and they say you can deduct those 100 out or out miles that you didn't get paid for at 57 and a half cents. The problem with that is you actually are deducting the expenses for those extra miles that you drove if you're keeping track of your um, expenses, you know, properly. You're gonna, you drove extra fuel. You spent extra fuel to go that extra 900 miles instead of 800 miles. You burn some rubber off your tires. You're gonna need to do some maintenance on your truck. You need to appreciate your truck faster. So you're actually expensing what it took to drive that extra 100 miles, and that is your deduction. If on top of that you went and took a 100 mile extra driven times 57 and a half cents, it would, it would essentially be a double deduction which is not something that the IRS is fond of and, and actually, you know, we'll come back and figure out and uh, charge you taxes and penalties and all kinds of things for. So I know it's frustrating, but you can do it one of two ways. You could take that whole 900 miles and you can just do it at the flat rate of 57 and a half cents a mile, but that would really be kind of dumb because your truck actually costs you about a dollar a mile to operate. So you can't do it both ways. You've got to do one or the other. And, you know, it's our belief and, and knowing, having done this for a long time, keeping track of actual expenses and deducting the actual expenses uh, will get you the best deduction. So hopefully that kind of clears that up. Uh, the fourth one is almost kind of funny um, because it's been debated over the years, the guard dog deduction. And honestly, there will be a lot of people and taxpayers that will tell you you can't take a guard dog deduction. But we spend time because we do so many returns actually doing research and having conversations with the IRS and, you know, asking them, uh, you know, what is right and what's wrong. And we've had the guard dog discussion with the IRS. And, you know, so the bottom line kind of goes to what I said a slide or two ago. Anything that is necessary and ordinary for your business is a tax deductible item. And so in the IRS's eyes and the way we would prepare a tax return, a guard dog can legitimately be used in your business. And, you know, a lot of people used to say, well, you've got to have a Doberman Pinscher or a German Shepherd or something like that. You know, I honestly don't care if it's a Chihuahua. If it barks a lot and your truck's parked at a truck stop in the middle of the night, and the dog starts barking when somebody walks by. It's a deterrent for your truck to not get stolen. And so a guard dog is a legitimate deduction, you know, the food and care of your dog um, while you're on the road. You could deduct as an expense. So that said, you know, let's just say your favorite pet chihuahua gets sick and you spent $5,000 in surgery to, you know, help it do knee surgery or whatever else. If you think about necessary and ordinary, that's probably not a necessary and ordinary expense of your business, and the IRS probably wouldn't allow you to take a $5,000 you know, medical bill for your dog. Um, but those normal everyday expenses with your dog are deductible. Medical expenses I'll just touch on because we're going to get into the Affordable Care Act in a few more slides. Um, the two things really to know about medical expenses is you can deduct all the premiums that you pay uh, for health insurance. And so if, you know, now that you're subject to penalties, if you don't have health insurance, if you've recently bought health insurance, the good news is on your Schedule C as a, you know, independent contractor, all those premiums you pay are a tax deduction. The bad news on medical expenses is there's a limit. And essentially what it says is I cannot deduct any medical expenses. So not the premiums, but the expenses. If I go to the ER or, you know, I have to go to the hospital with one of my kids or those kinds of things. I can't deduct any of those expenses until they exceed 10% of my adjusted gross income. So the average owner-operator's adjusted gross income will probably be forty dollars to $45,000. So until I spend over about $4,500 in medical expenses, I don't get that deduction. 
So the last thing I'm going to talk about a little bit is per diem. And per diem is a really confusing topic for a lot of folks, so we'll hopefully uh, shed some light on that. Before we do, I just want to uh, pull up another poll question, and we'll ask you a little bit about um, per diem. And uh, so you should see the poll question up there on your screen. If you don't mind answering it, we'll tell you what the results are again. All right, so the poll question goes to, um, for those of you on the phone, do you know how to properly, you know, calculate your full and partial days of per diem? And uh, it's about a 50-50 split. we got 47% that say yes and 53% that say no. So hopefully uh, as we go down uh, kind of explaining per diem, it'll bring that 50% that doesn't properly know how to calculate per diem um, on board with us so that you get it. Per diem is simply a deduction to make life easy for you, your tax preparer, and the IRS. And essentially the goal of it is to take away you having to keep track of every coffee, soda, hamburger, uh, bill while you're on the road. It's a, it's a standard deduction for your meals on the road while you're away from home. Um, the essence of it is it says that you can deduct $59 for every day that you're away from home on the road. In the end, when we put that in a tax return, the IRS only lets you deduct 80% of that. Um, so that's kind of the formula. You can take 80% of $59 for every day that you're away from home. The second piece of that is if you're only away from home for part of a day, uh, and definition of being away from home really is that you had to spend the night away from your own bed, so be in the bunk of your truck. So, so if, if uh, you know, I got dispatched out and I left tonight at 6 o'clock, um, I wasn't gone all day. I could eat breakfast, lunch, and probably dinner at home, and so I really probably shouldn't be able to deduct my meals on the road. But the IRS will let you take a partial day per diem, and you can get 75% for that day you were dispatched, and then you know 100% for every day you're away from home after that. One thing that we are running into with a lot of owner-operators is a lot of folks have moved to e-logs, and they're tracking you know, their hours of service electronically. Most fleets, if you're leased to a fleet, will deduct those after 90 days because that's all the DOT requires they have on hand and they don't want logs past that. And so if you go to the end of the year and you haven't kept track of your per diem days, it's very likely that the company doesn't have a record of those per diem days. So it's important that you have a record for the IRS. So again, at the bottom of here, there's a tool that you can use. It's a simple calendar you can download at atbsshow.com, uh, you know, free on our operator tools. And there's a calendar on there that you can simply mark a uh, day away from home or a partial day away from home. And at the end of the year, we can add all that up and figure out what your per diem deduction is going to be. In the end, what I want you to understand is per diem is a huge deduction. Maybe other than your truck and fuel, the biggest deduction that you get that saves you money on taxes. So it's worth doing and it's worth doing right. As an example, if you were away from home 300 days last year, that's about a $14,000 deduction on your taxes. So really an important deduction that uh, you need to pay attention to and, and make sure that we do things right. Next, I'm going to talk about tax credits. So if you remember back to the beginning when I was talking about uh, the things we're going to go through, a tax credit is probably the most important thing. There's not a lot of them, but unlike a deduction where you only get about a 20 or 25% savings on your taxes, for every tax credit you get, you save dollar for dollar on your taxes. Uh, so three common ones that we run into when we're working with independent contractors. Uh, number one, the American Opportunity Credit. Uh, this is a good one if you've got uh, college-age children that are you know, going to, going to college. You can deduct $2,500 for each of those uh, kids that you've got in college, um, that's a great deduction. The second one is more for those that have really kind of had a hard year. If uh, you were sick or your truck was broke down and you had a lot of time off the road and you didn't make a lot of money um, and you were a low income earner, there's an earned income tax credit. It's really complicated, so I won't go through kind of the calculations of how you get there, but um, this actually can get you a refund. Even if you didn't pay any taxes, it sometimes can get you money back on your tax return if you didn't make a lot of money the prior year. Uh, the third one is child care independent uh, tax credit. So if you've got kids that are um, under 13 years old or disabled and you have to provide daycare for them while you and your spouse are working, you can deduct $3,000 for one child or $6,000 for two or more. So uh, that's a really good deduction, or I'm sorry, a really good credit as well. I'm going to touch a little bit on bookkeeping now. And... Uh, you know, as I said in the beginning, we're here to talk about taxes, but one of the keys to being successful with a tax return is having proper records and making sure you're keeping track of everything. Um, so 
you know, tracking your revenue and your expenses are uh, critical things. As we talked about in the beginning, the IRS is going to know uh, what you got paid. So if you generated $150,000 in revenue being leased to a carrier last year, that carrier is going to send the IRS a 1099 that says you got $150,000. If you don't have anything to offset against that, um, you know, your expenses, then all the IRS is going to know that you made $150,000 and they're going to expect you to pay taxes based on that. Um, so the second thing on here is you want to keep and record all of your expenses. The good news is if you're an ATBS customer, all you do is simply send us that stuff in the mail or scan it or uh, however you do it, and we keep track of that and give you a monthly financial to keep track of all those things. So once you know your revenue and your expenses, kind of the uh, you know thing on the next page here is you take your gross income and your expenses, deduct those expenses from your income, and you come up with your net profit. Um, so in the end, that's what you're going to be taxed on. Your net profit ultimately winds up being what's called your adjusted gross income. So once you've deducted other things uh, that you're allowed to on your Schedule C, you wind up with your adjusted gross income, and that's what you're what you're taxed on. Uh, the IRS requires that you have records and keep them together for at least three years. And we often recommend that our clients keep their paperwork for five to six years because sometimes if the IRS can prove that you intended fraud or something else, it can go back further than three years. So three years is a minimum. Um, it's a good idea to have maybe things longer, uh, maybe five or six years if uh, if you ever get audited. You know, one of the most important things I'll say is it's important that you file your return as early as you can. You can extend past April 15th if you want to, but uh, the day you file your return is when that clock starts ticking. So for those 10% of you that have already done your tax return, the good news is the IRS, you know, clock has already started ticking. So three years from the date of you filing your tax return is when they can audit you. If you wait until October 15th, the last day you can file for an extension this year, um, then that three years starts on October 15th. So we recommend that you file as quickly as you can um, just so you can get that, that clock ticking as long as you've got good, uh, you know, all of your information. So talking about your business, you know, one thing that I always try to reiterate to our clients as owner-operators is, you know, our goal is to save you money on taxes. That's what we're talking about today. But, you know, in the end, the tax law is the tax law. And we can save you, you know, a few thousand dollars by doing tax returns the right way and making sure we're getting all of our deductions and all those kinds of things. But truly managing your business and paying attention to your business and looking at a monthly financial statement and all those kinds of things and, and really giving you good business advice, we can, you know, help you make ten, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars more in your business. And so we find a lot of people that get caught up in saying, you know, we want to screw the IRS and and we want to make sure we're not paying any taxes. But if you put all that effort into actually managing your business and making your business more effective, I think we see people be a lot more successful making more money in the business than we do, um, you know, trying to screw the IRS. Uh, as far as audit proofing your business, the most important thing, as we talked about, is keeping things for three years, but the IRS wants records of what you do. And so, you know, simply put, the IRS wants you to have a time, place, reason, and amount for everything that you spend money on. So whether it's your logbook or, you know, a download of e-logs for your per diem deduction, whether it's canceled checks or receipts, you've got to have a copy. You know, the, the great news for those of you that use ATBS is when you send those things to us, we scan and digitize them and put them out in the cloud. And so they're accessible at your fingertips anytime you want. You can go into your personal account, um, you know, through the Internet at ATBS and pull up those receipts at any time. And that's really critical. We do go through audits and represent our clients when they get audited by the IRS. And when the IRS comes in and audits a person that they see is really organized, has a copy of everything, the audits go extremely well. If they come in and you've got a trash bag full of five years' worth of tax returns and receipts and everything bundled together, you know, that's a heyday. They're going to spend the next three months at your house going through all those things because they know you're not organized and they're going to be able to catch you probably doing some things that, that aren't right. Um, so one of the last things we're going to touch on is uh, successful tax strategies and some things you can do to save money on taxes. Um, employing family members is an interesting one. Uh, you can, you know, pay your child some money that doesn't get reported on taxes if it's below a certain threshold, and they can do things like wash your truck for you or help you file paperwork and those kinds of things. Uh, retirement. Um, you, as an independent contractor, self-employed person, can set up certain kinds of retirement accounts for yourself, and you can contribute money to those retirement accounts, and those are tax-deductible. Um, you know, for those of you that are 
depending on Social Security to take care of you in your retirement, I'm not sure uh, I have good news that that will be around for you in 10 or 15 or 20 years. I would build my own nest egg if I have the ability to with the money I make. And good news is that's taxed to uh, truck show that's coming up, Mid-America Truck Show, in a few weeks. If you're going to Louisville to attend that and you drove your personal car, or even if you drove your truck, uh, those expenses are deductible. If you flew or if you stayed in a motel there, those are deductible. I know there are some seminars you can go to uh, cruises with people that are in trucking and learn how to operate a better truck line and you could deduct you know that cruise because you went on an educational thing to learn more about your business. Uh, Health care we talked a little bit about so I'm going to skip over that because we're going to jump into the Affordable Care Act and um, talk a little bit about that in a few more slides. Uh, I want to talk about choosing a business structure briefly because uh, there's a lot of confusion around that. Um, I will tell you that about 98% of the folks that we do tax returns for file as sole proprietors. And when I say that, what that means is they haven't set up a corporation or an LLC or anything else. They just do it simply under their name with a Schedule C on their own tax return. The reason is because that's the easiest. It doesn't cost extra money in the tax return, and it's just what makes sense. Um, for those that make more money, I'll talk a little bit about how you might be able to save money having uh, a company set up or those kinds of things. But one of the problems we see is a lot of folks listen to ads on the radio or they read things in newspapers and those kinds of things that say, you know, protect yourself from liability, set up your corporation today, and so they go set up a company, and they have no idea what that means to them from a tax perspective or really even a liability perspective. So, um, like I say, most folks, we do business deductible. Travel expenses, you know, outside of driving your truck, so things like the Louisville Swift are sole proprietors. A partnership only makes sense if you've got a partner in the business. If somebody helps you buy the truck and finance it, you know, put some money down with you, then maybe you want to set up a partnership that you operate the business in. Or sometimes a husband and wife will have a partnership, but partnerships are pretty rare. Um, we rarely, I almost never see somebody set up as a C-Corp, and I honestly can't think of an example that makes sense for a you know, small independent contractor, even up to four or five trucks, uh, that makes sense to have a C-Corp. An S-Corp does sometimes make sense, but what we typically recommend is a limited liability company or an LLC, mostly because it's easier from a setup and a filing perspective and keep a track of everything. And then you can file to be an S-Corp under that LLC. And uh, without you know getting too complicated, we've got folks here that can talk you through this scenario if you think it's something that makes sense for you. But if you're someone that makes net of about $65,000 or more as an owner-operator, your net income is 65000 or more, you might be able to save some money on self-employment taxes by setting up an LLC and filing as an S-Corp. And the way that happens is you can pay yourself as an employee of that uh, S-Corporation a lower wage than what you make in net income, and so you can save some money on uh, self-employment taxes. It's a you know true legitimate structure, and the way it works, it gets a little bit complicated. Like I say, someone at ATBS is happy to talk through it with you and see if you're a candidate and if it makes sense. But it, it's a it's something that can save you three or four thousand dollars if you're one of those higher wage earning um, independent contractors. So next I'm going to talk a little bit about the Affordable Care Act. And uh, I can tell you that this has become one of the most complicated pieces of our business in the last year. Um, in its infinite wisdom, the government and the IRS decided to make uh, tax return preparers kind of the enforcement uh, method for the Affordable Care Act. So I'm not sure what taxes have to do with health insurance. But uh, at the end of the day, it all boils down to your tax return. And that's where things are, are figured out. So. Um, a couple things that I want you to think about or understand around the Affordable Care Act. Number one is the penalties. So if you haven't done your tax return yet and you didn't have health care for last year, uh, you're going to have to fill out some questions that are going to be put on your tax return. And um, what happens ultimately is if you did not have health insurance, you're subject to a penalty. And that penalty is pretty simple for last year. It's either $95 per adult on the return or 1% of your adjusted gross income. Of the returns that we've done so far, I would tell you there's been an average of about probably 200, uh, $250 to $300 for those that did not have health insurance and the penalties. So they wind up paying a percentage, that 1% of their adjusted gross income um, in the penalty. Second thing is there's a premium tax credit for folks that did not make enough money or, or, or lower income earners. You actually can get a credit on your premium. And so the way that works is when you go into one of these healthcare exchanges to buy your insurance, because now you're required to have insurance, um, you'll fill out some income numbers and estimate what you're going to make. 
if your numbers are you know low enough, then they will actually give you a credit and say if your premium is eight hundred dollars a month for your health insurance, they may only charge you five hundred dollars. You get a three hundred dollar credit um, because you're a low wage earner, and so that's good news. Um, and it'll save some money on taxes. The problem with that is if you underestimate uh, what your income is going to be, you're going to wind up uh, having to deal with that and pay for it in, in taxes. So as as we talk about that um, a little bit, I think the IRS or the government you know, found out that there were people that learned how to play that game, and there were a lot of folks that underestimated their income, and they're finding some pretty significant penalties when they do their 2015 tax returns. Um, so a couple of things that, uh, you know, going to 2015 now that we're fully in the Affordable Care Act and everything's tying in to, you know, full, being fully implemented and those kinds of things. One is uh, you can be exempted from being required to have health insurance under the Affordable Care Act, uh, but it's a pretty rigorous test. And my guess is most people uh, that are on the line will not fall under it. It's things like true hardship. Um, you know, I had something happen and and uh, I file with the IRS so I don't have to buy it. Uh, there are religious exclusions, um, but again, those are pretty well defined. You have to be in a religion that is not required to pay Social Security or Medicare. Uh, if that's the case, then you also don't have to have insurance under the Affordable Care Act. If you're a member of an Indian tribe, uh, there's a possibility that you can have ex an exclusion from having to have health insurance. Or if your income is low enough, you can be excluded. And, and there are some other exclusions. It gets really complicated. Um, but those are some of the basic ones. Um, so purchasing health care coverage outside of the open enrollment period, I'm not sure if you've heard, but it's been on the news lately. The open enrollment period for 2015 was from November of 15th of 2014 to February 15th of 2015. So it just ended literally a couple of days ago. So if you didn't buy coverage for 2015, you're pretty much out of luck and you're going to be subject to the penalty at this point. And so, you know, talking about these penalties is important to you so you understand them. Um, the penalties for 2015 for not having coverage go up significantly. Uh, it's $325 per adult. So remember it was $95 last year. It's $325 this year per adult or 2% of your adjusted gross income. So if our average you know, so far this year has been about a $300 penalty that'll probably go up to at least $600 next year. So the penalties are going to get to the point where people are going to be forced to buy insurance because they don't want to pay the exorbitant penalties. Um, so if you did not buy health insurance for the Affordable Care Act by, you know, a few days ago, February 15th, there's a few things that can allow you to get back in and get coverage, but again, there are specific life events. Uh, things like you got married or you had a child that was born that you need to cover, or if you lost your coverage, if you were an employee uh, and you decided to become a health, or I mean an independent contractor through the year, so you lost your employee coverage when you changed jobs, that'll allow you to go into the exchange and buy coverage. Um, so the last thing I want to talk about on here is as part of your tax return, when you do your tax return this year, uh, there are new forms. And I can tell you we spent a couple of days here at ATBS training our tax preparers and kind of going through all the scenarios. It gets really complicated. It goes through every month and there's, you know, did you have health insurance for January through December? If not, there's a penalty. If you bought it in March, then you got a penalty for January and February. And a lot of time and effort, so you know it complicates the tax return process, and it's not a lot of fun. But uh, like I say, it's the the wisdom of the government making the IRS the enforcement and tax preparers the enforcement arm of um, the Affordable Care Act. So, um, last thing or two I want to touch on is uh, you should file a tax return no matter what you do on time. Uh, there's really no reason not to. Um, even if you don't have the money to pay your taxes by April 15th, you can file an extension, which will qualify as filing on time until you do get it filed. But if you just flat don't out file a tax return, uh, there's a 5% per month penalty. So let's just say you don't file an extension on April 15th and you don't file a tax return, you know, by the end of the summer, you're going to be paying a 60% penalty on the tax that you owe. So file the return no matter what or file an extension. If you file but you don't have the money to pay, um, there's a half percent per month penalty. So it can be up to 6% a year uh, if you file, but you don't have the money to pay. So the key is getting your tax return filed. So, you know, to kind of wrap things up, um, 
I want to say that you know ultimately the tax burden in paying taxes rests with you. You will probably use a professional to help you make sure you do your tax return properly. But being organized and you know making sure you keep in track of things, just the simple fact of losing one receipt that's an expense for $100 uh, and not getting that in your tax return that can cost you $25 in taxes that you don't have to pay. So key is being organized and making sure you know meeting with your tax preparer that you got everything together and um, those kinds of things. So you know, at ATBS, we're in full swing. We've got full staff. We're doing hundreds of tax returns a week these days. Um, if you need help, uh, feel free to go to this link at atbsshow.com, and you can download our tax organizer. It'll help you kind of get things together and ask you the right questions to make sure you've got everything you need for your taxes. Uh, we have a deadline of March 6th, which was just, you know, a few weeks around the corner. If you have everything to us by March 6th, we will get your tax return done by April 15th. If it's after that date, we'll get your taxes done. But um, just you know, based on the backlog and number of returns we have to do, it'll be after April 15th, so we'll file an extension for you. And uh, with that, I'm going to wrap up and uh, open up the lines. I know uh, we probably have had a few questions come in, so I'll get Mike Callahan on the line with us, who's our uh, head CPA and runs our tax department. and. Uh, we can talk about some of the questions that have come in, and um, I might just let uh, Sean take over my end of the phone, and uh, he can ask the questions that have come up. And thanks to all of you that participated; I, we appreciate it. All right. The first question that came in was: I have two sons that worked last year for the summer. Do I turn their W-2s in with my paperwork? Uh, this is Mike Callahan. Good afternoon. Uh, typically, we do do um, children's returns um, for clients of ours uh, at no charge, so you can send those in. Uh, if they just had a W-2, uh, it's a pretty simple return. The next question is, what if you are in the U.S. for a partial day and Canada for a partial day? How is per diem calculated? There are you get a partial day, which is three quarters of the per diem rate. Um, I would use if you're in the U.S. and you're departing from the U.S. I would use three quarters of the uh, within the continental U.S. per diem rate. Uh, if you're departing from Canada, I would use three quarters of outside the continental U.S. per diem rate. Okay, and the next question is, what is the penalty for not paying estimated taxes? The penalty calculation for not paying estimated taxes is quite complicated. There's a Form 2210 that's filed with the tax return, and it's calculated on a per day basis. Um, and since there's four periods where estimated taxes are paid, it's calculated separately for each period. Um, so for the first period, it's April 15th. If you don't pay it then, it's calculated from that date all the way through until you pay it. So if you don't pay it until the following April 15th, it's 365 days, and it's at a rate of 3%. And the last question that we have is, my wife rides in the truck with me but doesn't drive. Can she claim per diem as well? Um, Generally, she may, if um, she may get a ride-along per diem rate, which is $46 a day, and she would be entitled to 50% of that, so $23 a day. But she must help in the business um, with loads or, you know, mapping out weather routes, those sorts of things. And it's critical that that she, he or she, also keeps a driving log as well to document those days. And that's all the questions we have. I want to thank everyone for joining today. Uh, if you happen to miss any of the webinar, once again, you can go to atbsshow.com or teamrunsmart.com. And within the next couple of days, we will have a recording of the entire webinar on there for you to listen to. And once again, thank you very much.